only promote the truth. Welcome. What a great, great topic. I feel like this has been decades in the making for me to do this particular training, this particular message. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to my first time. I'm coming out <clears throat> to explain to you my teachings, my training, my belief on Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 out of the scriptures that is based on faith. I've taken a lot of time over the last couple of days as this came on my heart to share this message. Took a lot of time to, uh, to gather my thoughts on how I wanted to present this. You know, being that this is the first time I've utilized the platform of Facebook Live to share any of my spiritual beliefs. Now, I really believe that this message can help anybody, regardless if you have a certain faith, a spiritual belief, and even if you don't have any spiritual beliefs, I believe this message, you can take foundational principles from this message, and you can apply this message in your life, no matter what you're doing. So that's what I, I firmly believe. Now, if you have anyone that is into um, into faith-based teachings, anybody that studies scriptures, anybody that is into religion, anybody that's into success principles, you can utilize this from every single angle you can imagine. And so I'm going to take time today, I'm gathering some of my information here, I'm going to take some time today and uh, as we let some folks come on, I'll give the official notification that we're going in. So I'm going to take some time today, and I'm going to break some things down to you, and I'm probably going to hit you with some things that you probably never heard before. Uh, you might not even have pondered before. I want to first state um, that I'm not coming to you from any particular uh, organized religion viewpoint. I do not belong to a specific organized religious group. I am completely unapologetically non-denominational. So what I'm sharing with you is based upon my own studies, based upon my own research and my own application of such in my life. So I'm, I'm very excited as we have a few more people I heard that are coming on and then we'll get this thing started. So I'm, I'm excited as I'll get out to bring this to you and get this message to you uh, today. So a lot of great things are going to come out of this message. <laughs> I'm really excited for each and every person that gets to hear this from the viewpoint I'm going to bring it from. I'm, I'm really interested in watching your reaction and seeing how you deal with this information. I just think it's going to really challenge a lot of the beliefs maybe you've had. And... Uh, and for some of you, take your beliefs to an entirely different level. So I'm excited about getting this uh, information to you. So I'm going to dial up a couple of programs I've got here. All right, let's get that dialed up. That way I can jump to where I want to jump to. I want to welcome everybody on here. hope you all having a fantastic day. I really believe that today is going to be life-changing for many of you. Many of you are going to be you're going to be completely changed. Okay, so here we go. Hey, I want to welcome you to this particular training and my belief system when it comes to the word faith. I'm going to be teaching from the scriptures uh, that is based on Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, this is known uh, as considered the faith chapter in all of the scriptures. If you have a Bible, that's considered the faith chapter, or even better yet, the faith warrior chapter. 
because it talks about some faith warriors. So I want to share to you uh, a little bit about that. Now, taking some notes, so you'll see me kind of grabbing my notes because I want to make sure I get these points across to you today. But these are all based upon my particular beliefs, and I just wrote these notes out. Very few have really been trained on the subject of faith. And yet faith is the key to having a successful life. Now, think about that for a second. Many, very few have been trained on the subject of faith. You go all the way back to when you were when you were first born. Who really took the time and said, I'm going to break down, not take you to church, not just take you to church, not take you to a Sunday school or Bible school or take you to a camp. I'm talking about we're going to take this word and we're going to break it down. In order to have a successful life, you have to know faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, before I go break, I'm going to read the whole chapter, but before I break down the whole chapter, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, which is the creator of all. For he who comes to him has to believe that he is and that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently and earnestly seek him. Think about that. So if, if this, this, is so inc- this is so critical because many of us pray. Many of us pray. But what this scripture is telling us, that if we're praying, we have to pray based on faith, and it's impossible to please the one that answers prayer without faith. So how critical is faith when it comes to our lives. You know, Martin Luther stated, without faith, nothing is possible. With faith, all things are possible. Isn't that a great quote? Without faith, nothing is possible. And with faith, all things. So we go from nothing, one end of the spectrum of nothing, to all things, to everything becomes possible with this little word called faith. So therefore, faith becomes the most important element in a person's life. Think about what we're talking about here. Faith all of a sudden becomes the most important element in a person's life experience. This this thing called life is an experience for us. See, if we want to breathe, this is what I was thinking about the other day. If we want to breathe the atmosphere of heaven, how many of you want to be in heaven? Even if you don't believe in heaven, doesn't that sound great to be in a place called heaven? If you want to breathe the atmosphere before you get there, before a person gets to heaven, wouldn't you love to breathe the atmosphere? of faith, of of heaven? Well, if you want to breathe the atmosphere of heaven, we must first breathe the true element that's part of heaven called faith. See, once you exercise the element, the true essence of the element of faith, you then get to breathe. Everybody take a deep breath in and go, Do it one more time. Take a deep breath in. Now imagine if you were breathing in the oxygen, the atmosphere of heaven. How pure, how joyous, how abundant is that oxygen of that atmosphere called heaven? It's incredible because as I decided to go in, you know, before I came on to do this particular training, I was talking to the creator. I was having a conversation with the creator. And back in the days when they would have battle, the great warriors of the creator, they would say, shall we go up? So before I decided to do this message, I heard in my spirit, shall I go up? I'm talking to the creator. Shall I go ahead and go up and bring a message 
that will never be forgotten for all who listen to this message because I know it's going to come from the atmosphere of the Most High. I have complete faith in what I'm saying because I've walked in it. Do you, shall I go up? Now, background before I go up. My major, I grew up. I grew up. My grandfather was a deacon in the Baptist church. My great-grandfather was a deacon in the Baptist church. I grew up in church. I grew up around a lot of spiritual and religious things. And it always intrigued me as I got to accountability ages. I started reasoning. You know, when I got to around that age of 20, go read the, 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 the chapter in Numbers. It talks about the age of true accountability is when you hit around the age of 20. When I hit the age of 20, I started breathing and asking more questions. Not just what I was taught, not just what I heard, but then I began to think for myself and I began to become accountable. I began to ask more and more questions. A few years later, around 1992, I started to really go in. I started to really research and dig. And I was, I just came off my, one of my best years ever in professional baseball. I just won my second minor league stolen base championship. We just won the double A championship in the Texas league with the San Diego Padres. So most of that team was going up to the major leagues the next year or there shortly after I was going to be one of them. And I decided to quit. I decided to stop playing. And I decided to go find out the deep spiritual things in life. Why am I here? All these questions I've been asking all these years from my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my uncles, and from all these pastors and preachers. As I began to dig down and peel through my scriptures, through my Bible, I started watching and figuring out things. And some of these things didn't make complete sense to me. And I could not get the answers to everything I was looking for. And I would, whenever it was a stump time, I'd always hear the same thing. Well, some things, the creator just, he just keeps to himself. And that never sat right with me. Because I would read, anything you ask for in his name shall be given to you. So that was a contradiction that some things are withheld when the scripture was saying anything that you ask for in his name. He would say, when two or more gathered in agreement on any one thing, it shall be done on earth. So I was like, I want to apply this. I want to apply this and I want to get the answers to these deep questions. And that pushed me to dig a little further. And so I went on a big, big journey. And it took me from around 1992, off and on digging, because I went back and played ball after I took a year off. I, I, got, I, I bought so many Bible versions, so many translations, so many concordances, so many lexicons, so many everything having to do with scripture studies. My mom thought I was going nuts. My dad was like, what are all these boxes for? They couldn't believe all these boxes that I had of all the research I was doing. I got a little frustrated after digging because I was going to theologians. I was going to scholars. I was saying, look, this here looks like this here doesn't balance out. And I couldn't get the answers. I was going from one denomination to another denomination, asking preachers, pastors, scholars, and I just couldn't get all the answers. So I got frustrated. I got to admit, I got frustrated. How many of you have ever got a little frustrated? See, this is a raw, this is a raw conversation. If you're here with me, I'm praying that you're coming in a spirit of truth. And you understood when I said, shall we go up? Now, not only shall I go up, I'm challenging you. Shall you go up? Is it time for you to go up to a higher level of thinking? So I decided to go up. From 1992 all the way to 2004, October 2004, I had a very, 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 Life-changing event. Somebody very close to me, their father got pancreatic cancer. And he was a deeply religious man. And he believed that he was going to be healed utilizing the power of the scriptures, the words in the scriptures where it says, and these are the signs that shall follow. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. How many of you heard that before? How many of you heard that before? 
How many of you have seen promises in the scriptures and you prayed and you have other prayed on it and yet not all the time those promises come true? And I found that to be a contradiction. What's going on? What's the problem? So in 2004, I went on one of the deepest journeys anybody I know uh, of anybody I know. I went on a deep one. I started studying. I started taking up etymology, which is the study of the origins of words. I found out that, the, that English is like the newest language in the world. There's all these other languages, and English is the newest. So I'm like, these words that we have now are in the hundreds of years old, as opposed to the at least thousands of years that the earth has been here. So I wanted to trace back words. So I began to go on deep scripture research. I started to study Greek. I started to study Aramaic. I started to study Hebrew. I started to study Paleo-Hebrew. And I started to do this on an average of six, it was a minimum six hours a day, six to 10 hours a day from around October 2004 to, to the end of December 2007. So we're talking about three plus years of six to 10 hours a day I dove in. Why do I tell you that? Because I think, it's, I think it's important that I qualify myself. If you're going to be listening to such important words, I think it's important that I qualify myself as someone who was diligent. Diligent about finding out why am I here? Where are these words coming from? How did we get to this point? This book that I'm reading called the King James Version. Who is King James? Why is it his version? the Mayflower Bible. Who is that? And then I started to accumulate some of the oldest writings in the world. I started to accumulate things like the 1611 King James Version, the Mayflower Bible, uh, a Texas Receptus, a Codex Leningrad, a Codex Vaticanus, a Codex Alexandrius, a Codex Sinaiticus, you know, Started studying things like P45, P46, P stands for papyrus. You know, started studying these things and looking where they were housed in these different museums. And I started getting facsimile copies and studying and digging in to see, like the Berean said, you know, to see if these things be true. I started to study to show myself approved. And after coming out of those three plus years, Here's what happened to me. I came to my own conclusions and my own faith about why I believed or chose to believe what I believe. No longer did I take my faith and base it on what someone was saying to me just from a pulpit. And I'm not trying to knock anybody. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody. I'm telling you my personal experience and giving you some of my qualifications. I began to own my own thoughts. I would be considered now what's, what would be called a rogue scholar. I'm proud of that fact that I, I could be considered a rogue scholar. So I wanted to preface everything I'm about to dig in and teach you based on that. Now let's talk about the timing of right now. You know, Daniel, when you read the book of Daniel, Daniel played a very important part in our world. It says, as for this time in the history of the earth, for this time, I believe Daniel is speaking to us more now than ever because he was told, quote, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the end of time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So it gives a very significant meaning to this verse that maybe most of us have not thought about. He says, for you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal this book when? Until the end of time. And then it gives a clue on how we could tell 
if it was the end of time. When is the end of time? How can we tell if the book and the writings that Daniel gave have went from shut to opening up? It says, many shall run to and fro, looking and wandering and digging. And then it gives the key. And then knowledge shall increase. Right now in this time, knowledge is increasing like never before. And I took some conscious, competent time to think about this. What has happened in the last 150 years? How many inventions? I'm talking, we all scientists agree. All theologians, all scholars, all archaeologists agree that the earth is at least, at least 6,000 years old. They agree that it's at least 6,000 years old. Some say millions, but the minimum is at least 6,000 years old. So now I look at Daniel when he says, and knowledge shall increase as the sign that the book is being unsealed, being opened up. So after 1,000 years, there's no car, there's no computers, right? There's no cell phones, right? There's no internet, there's no electricity. 2,000 years, there's none of that. 3,000 years, there's none of that. 4,000 years, there's none of this. No automobiles, no trains. Now, you got to stop and think about how important this is. Everybody touch yourself, touch yourself, just tap yourself. That means you're a human being that's living and breathing. The people from these thousands of years were just human beings, just like us. They had eyes, nose, lips, ears, teeth, right? Chest, legs, feet, just like us. And yet 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 plus years, they couldn't figure out how to make a car a plane, thousands of years of human beings walking around, nobody could figure out how to make a computer, a laptop. Think about what's happened in the last 150 years. These are the things that's happened just in the last 150 years. You want to know why? The book, in my opinion, in my studies has been opened up. That seal is now released. Knowledge is now increasing at such a rapid rate. It's almost mind-boggling. I think we'd all have to agree something is going on for one, two, three, four, five thousand plus years and no car. Something's going on. If all these things in such a condensed period of time could be created. So knowledge is being increased. Awareness at all times is being increased. The creator of all is now beginning to pour out his spirit and let people see what's happening. And he's given us all a choice to acknowledge. So now people ask me, Jay, why do you believe there is a creator? And I got respect for everybody. All religious people that know me, I love on everybody. I love on everybody. You know, I love on everybody. They, pe people ask me, why do you specifically believe there's a creator? And I, I will point at a painting. See that painting back behind me? See, that painting is proof that there's a painter. So everything that's created proves there was a creator. Just like the painting is proof that somebody painted it, there was a painter. Then creation proves there is a creator. Now, shall we go up? Who's ready to go up? Because I'm just getting started just a little bit. I've been having this message in me for decades. And now here it comes. For whatever reason, I believe the seal's being opened. I believe I'm going to do it. One of the conduits on the, on the earth, there's several people that I believe are true conduits of releasing information that's been sealed. I just specifically believe faith. 
because of my diligence that I can deliver this message without wavering. I can deliver this message in full confidence. Shall we go up is the question. If you are watching this, you got to ask yourself, shall you go up? Shall I go up? Am I ready to go up? Am I ready to challenge myself at the highest level so I can figure out really why I'm here and really what the truth is? Shall I go up? Shall we go up? So in going up, I'm going to set some ground rules. I'm going to give some, I'm doing some house rules here in my teaching. Now, I don't use generic terms when I refer to the creator or the savior. So I do my best. This is me. I'm going to give you me to refrain from terms such as God and Lord. The reason is those are just titles. So I'm going up now. It's my research. Those titles could just as easily be used to describe false deities as opposed to the creator and the savior themselves. So I believe I should try and I encourage you to try to be as specific as possible as to who you are talking to and especially who you are praying to. I want to reference 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Mm. I'm going to go ahead and go, go over to it. Y'all want to go in? Because we're going in. I'm going to go in to uh, 1 Corinthians. And this is Paul writing. So again, we're going to go deep. If you got to go, go. If you want to go in, you can come in with me. I've been waiting for decades to get this message out. So I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians. Give me one second. All right, here we go. Here we go. Now I'm going to use, just so everybody understands better, I'll use the New King James Version when I'm speaking. But I typically will read out a different version. So I'll read out of something like this. This is called The Scriptures. You can get this at isr-messianic.org. This book, this translation comes out of South Africa. What they've done is they removed any ambiguity around about any names or anything that could be linked to stuff that's like false or paganism or whatever. They just removed it. So I, just to be safe, I'll grab this one, the scriptures out of South Africa. They've done a great job. Been around for decades. So I'm going to go check out 1 Corinthians, but I'm going to use the New King James on this. 8, 5. Paul says, Paul says, for if, for even if there are so-called, so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came from, and that we live. And there is but one Master, through whom all things came and through whom we live. So that's why I want to be specific as possible so I know who I'm talking to, I know specific, there's no, no ambiguity. So I'm going to go in, as I read and, and give you information, I want to give you information based on that. So I believe there's only one creator. And I believe there's only one son of the creator. So I like to be careful and accurate anytime I refer to each of them. I always refer to the creator if I'm staying to where I don't want to confuse anybody as I'm teaching folks, I'll say creator, but when I'm referring to him, I want to refer to the father by his actual name, Yahuwah, Yahuwah. And this is indisputable, can't dispute this. I'm now, I'm so convinced, so I'm like, all right, that's his name. Y-A-H, in English, you would spell it Y-A-H-U. A-H, Y-A-H-U-A-H. That would be English. 
And if you're writing that in Hebrew, it'd be a yo, a hey, a ua, a hey. Yo, hey, yod, hey, ua, hey. We can get into that more later. And his son, by his actual name, Yahusha, Yahusha. And it's unique about what Yahusha means. Sha in Hebrew means salvation. And that's what caught my attention when Mel Gibson did the Passion of the Christ when they was calling the Savior Yeshua, when they were speaking in Aramaic. Mel Gibson wanted to be as accurate as possible when he made the movie, so he did it in Aramaic, and they had English subtitles. So anytime you notice they say the name of the Savior on Passion of the Christ, I mean, you've seen that movie, great movie, they would say Yeshua. Well, Yeshua is just short for the word salvation. It's kind of like a nickname, salvation. But his real name when he walked on the earth was Yahusha. See, what I learned is the name Jesus is the English version of the Greek attempt to transliterate the Savior's name. So it's just the Greek attempt to transliterate the Savior's name. Me, I'm saying everybody do what you want. I like to be as accurate as possible so I don't have any guessing about who I'm talking to, who I'm praying to, so that they know exactly who I'm praying to. So I don't want no ambiguity. So I went all the way back and said, oh, I'm going to get this straight. And, you know, and I tried it when I'm dealing with their name because names never change. Words might change, but names never change globally. So again, I like to be as accurate as possible. Therefore, I use Yahusha HaMashiach. Yeah, now I'm talking to him about who he is to me. Yahusha Ha, the Mashiach, the Messiah. So if I say Yahuwah, I'm talking to the Father. If I'm talking to the Son, I say Yahuwah HaMashiach, the Messiah. If I'm talking in regards to the Spirit, I say Yahuwah Ruach. Ruach is the Spirit, see? So when you hear me say the name Yahuwah, I'm talking about the Father. If you hear me say the name Yahusha, I'm talking about the Son. And again, not offending anybody because everybody's got to come. Everybody's got to come to the realization of certain truths. And what I'm telling you is that the seal that was spoken of in Daniel, we have every indication that is opened up and knowledge is being increased. So that's what hits me when I go, oh, knowledge is being increased. Maybe these names were hidden or people were doing the best they could do with translations or people had ulterior motives. Who cares about why what was done? Who cares about that? What I care about is what I always cared about when I started this journey, digging hard in 1992. Tell me the truth. That's all I want to know. Let me as an adult go ahead and deal with the truth. How many of you feel the same? Just tell me the truth. I'm an adult. I can handle it. Does that make sense? So that's our groundwork. So if you hear me talking, I'll be specific. If I'm talking about the father, you hear me say Yahuwah. If you hear me talking about the father, I mean about the son, you hear me say Yahusha. And the funny part is all scholars know that the prophet that followed Moshe, Moses, his real name was Moshe, his name was Joshua, who we call Joshua, but we know his name couldn't have been Joshua because the letter J is less than 500 years old. See, think about if we do a little etymology. Think how important it is. If we just do a little bit of etymology and we go back and we say, when that letter J showed up? See, I own a 1611 King James. That's what's so unique. And it proves that that letter J wasn't around. I don't see a J in the 1611 King James. I see an I. Instead of it saying Jesus, it said Iesus. Go study for yourself. You'll see it. So it's been transliterated over time. And so Joshua, whose real name was what? Yahusha. All scholars say and believe that the Savior, when he walked on earth, and Joshua, Yahusha, who followed Moshe Moses, had the same name. And you even see captions in your scriptures when you're reading. It's pretty unique. Unbelievable. So it's no big deal. Just don't go crazy over all this. Let's just say, hey. I want to literally just know the truth. And as an adult, I'm going to make my decisions based on the truth. Okay? So now we got some groundwork set. Shall we go up? How many of you want to go up? Told you we're going up. How many of you want to go up? Some of you are like, I don't know if I want to go up this deep. That's okay. I'm here with you. 
I love you, man. I honor you. I appreciate you being here because I know this is, I told you in the beginning, this might be some stuff y'all never heard before, but it's true. I proved it. How many of you want to go up? All right, we're going up. Keep going up. Here we go. Most will say the word faith. Now I'm going to go dig into faith now while we're all here. Most will say the word faith equals belief. And that is true. But it is only, but it's only a part of it. Belief is just a part of it. It's so awesome. I've got some pastors on here telling me to preach and go at it. I appreciate all the Bible scholars and pastors and teachers and everybody that's joined in on this. I, I just, I love this community we have it right now. So thank you so much for that feedback. But belief is just a part of faith. There's so much more than that. You know, I went and dug and I got this 1828 dictionary. And I found this is one of the best, best definitions of faith. It came out of a, an 1828 dictionary. It says faith, I'm going to read my notes here, check this out. Faith is the assent or agreement of the mind to the mind to the truth of what is declared by another resting on his authority and truthfulness without any other evidence or proof that's needed or is available. And it is a mental judgment that what, what another states and or testifies is indeed the truth. So faith, what this is basically saying is, it's the agreement from one mind to the next mind of what is being said is good enough based upon me just knowing who said it, and that's all I need to know. Based upon who I know that said it, I'm good. See, if you know the person who says it, and you know their character and their morality, and they say something, you don't need to see anything else. Their word, what they stated, is evidence enough that's why for us to know him, to know Yahuwah, I got chills all up and down my arms. Woo! For me to know Yahuwah, when I know him, I don't need to see him. I don't need to see him. Because his, his creation, as the scripture says, is Plenty enough evidence that he exists. What if that's the test of our entire life's test? That our only clue we would have is creation itself. And on that, we would then have to believe. The test is, do you believe there's a creator or not? Simply because the, the, the sky, the cloud, the sun, the moon, the ocean, the sand on the sea, on the beach, the earth, the seasons, the rain, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the fires. What if all of that creation is the true test of whether or not we believe that he is? I got chills, man. I don't know about y'all. I'm tore up. I'm tore up. Because I've had to stand on this word. I've had to stand on this all my life. I had to stand on it. And there was times when my parents failed me. My family failed me. My friends failed me. And all I had was to simply have his word that he promised me he would never leave me nor forsake me. What if that was it? What if that's all I had was just to hold on to his word? When everything else would go against me, I still could look at creation and say, you're there, Yahoo, you're there. And you said, 
Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am to fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, your staff, your creation comforts me. And then he said, he will prepare a table for me to sit down and eat in the midst of my enemies. When my enemies are trying to kill me, when they shoot me from every angle, he said, I'll give you a table to sit down and eat. And don't worry about those. Those that's the fire I require, as it says in Revelation 3. Chapter 3, I require gold that has been refined in the fire. I can't worry about what my enemies are saying and how they're shooting at me. He said, I'm not going to let it kill you unless I say it's your time to leave. That's the only time it can kill you. I have to give it permission to the evil one before you can be taken out. Until you've served your purpose on this earth, you are to sit and have a table prepared before you. And I claim this for everybody watching that wants to come into agreement with me. There shall be a table prepared in the midst of our enemies. Woo! Man. Woo! How am I going to get through this training? <laughs> a table in the midst of our enemies so we can eat. Faith then is a soul deep conviction that's, that what somebody else is telling you is true. See, you know that person, so you don't need any other proof. I decided that these words that I was reading and this evidence of creation, keep looking at her because I'm looking out my window. See the light coming in. This evidence of creation I decided that's all I needed. So then that means that takes me to the next level. I haven't got I haven't even got to reading Hebrews chapter 11. That means that then faith is not a feeling. That's where a lot of us get messed up. That's where on my journey I would get messed up. Sometimes I would get discouraged. Remember I told you 1992 I got discouraged because I was trying to put my faith attached to my feelings and faith is not a feeling. So a lot of us get confused. Feeling and faith at their basis are two different things. When most get discouraged, they feel it's because they lack faith. How many of y'all been there before? If you get discouraged, how many of you ever got discouraged? Go, oh, I don't have the faith. Oh, it's because I don't have the faith. See, and that in turn causes more discouragement. How many of you have been there before? See, it causes more discouragement. This brings on feelings of guilt. Now this thing starts to compile. You're talking to an eyewitness of this process. Now here comes the guilt. So now you're in a trap. How many of you ever been in a trap? The reason you get into a faith trap is because you're trying to tie it to a feeling. So it's best to define faith first before dealing with feelings. See, then you can put them together. I'll teach you how to put faith and feelings working in agreement together. Until you properly define faith, you will not be in agreement with your feelings and you're going to get discouraged. And the discouragement is going to bring on feelings of guilt that's going to compile on you and you're going to lose all these blessings you could have had. When you base faith, when you have faith, when you brace that faith that Yahuwah is who he says he is, we got to simplify it. That Yahuwah is who he says he is. Who is he? The creator of all. That's what he is. I mean, that's who he is. I'm sorry. Who he is, is the creator of all. Go on, write that down. Yahuwah is the creator of all. That's who he is. He is the creator of all. Simplify. All powerful is what he is. Y'all, come on now. Come on now. Who he is, is the creator of all. What he is, is all-powerful. 
So who he is is the creator of all. What he is is all powerful. Put them together. Then we say, Yahuwah gives us promises and has the actual ability to fulfill his promises based on our faith in him for who he is and what he can do. <laughs> See, this, sim this simplified this to me. When I said, oh, why is creation so important now? Because it's going to deal with my faith. You see? Now when I go, oh, that's the creator. Who is he? Yahuwah. He's the creator of all. What is he? He's all powerful. What did he do? He gave me some promises. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm good. That's why when some of y'all see me go through trials and tribulations and stuff, you don't see me wavering. You don't see me wavering. You see me walking through this experience of life. You see me accepting my trials. You accept, I'm accepting my fire. When the fire comes, I know it's to make me more purified. David, how many y'all believe in how many y'all believe in the beautiful Psalms of David? It says David, whose real name is Daoud. Daoud. It says that he had a heart after Yahuwah. He said, a man after my own heart. David, he says, a man, Daoud is a man after my own heart. Now, this should give us all some extreme awesome hope. Because if he says, David, who at times was buck wild, did some crazy stuff. Right? He did some crazy things. Many of us get guilted down about our past, and we need to stop and say, Yahuwah, you said David is a man after your own heart. He did some crazy stuff. I done some crazy stuff. And so if I just now do what David did, repent, humble myself, ask for forgiveness, come to you and your promises. It says, all who call on the name of Yahuwah shall be saved. That's what the scripture says verbatim. Let's read them Hebrew, those, those Hebrew scriptures. All who call on the name of Yahuwah shall be saved. A great example of faith and how it works in relation to how Yahuwah works. It says, when I was thinking about this, see the relationship I got with my son gives me proof that this is how it works. My son trusts my authority because he believes in my promises. When I promise him I'm going to take him to the park, I take him to the park. And when I promise him I'm going to watch a certain cartoon, I watch a certain cartoon. When I promise him if he doesn't get certain things done, I'm going to take certain things away, I take certain things away. When I, have, when I promise him if he messes this thing up or he talks back to his mom, he going to get some discipline, he gets some discipline. When I promise him a reward, he gets a reward. So now he fully believes in my authority to deliver the promises. That's how our father, Yahuwah, works. Matthew chapter 8, the story of the centurion, sick soldier. He comes to Yahusha, master, I have a, one of my soldiers is sick. One of my servants is sick. One of my servants is sick. And then what's Yahusha say? Yahusha HaMashiach, what does he say? Well, come on, let's go. Let's go and uh, let's go take care of him. What did, what did, the, what did the centurion soldier say? He wasn't a follower, wasn't a big faith. He wasn't, I'm sorry, he wasn't no big, quote, religious person. He wasn't. What'd he say? Huh? I'm not worthy to have you come in my home. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Think about that. 
A person is no big religious person, no big spiritual person, but understands authority and who he was dealing with. He knew he was dealing with the Messiah. He knew he had extraordinary authority. He knew what was going on. And what did he say? You don't have to come. You know, all you got to do is just say the word. He says, I'm a man of authority. I have soldiers under me. I tell this one to go there, he goes there. I tell this one to do this, he does that. You can do the same thing. He understood authority. We have to, under, if we're going to understand faith, we got to understand authority. Just say the word. What did Yahushua say? How did he respond to this? After all these people following him, following him, seeing all these miracles he's done, being with him through thick and thin, after all these things he's done, what does Yahushua say? He turns to his disciples and he says, I have not seen faith like this anywhere. He said, I haven't seen faith like this anywhere. Y'all been with me night and day, day and night, watching everything. He didn't give them credit for that incredible faith. He said, this man who understood authority understood the power of faith as it relates to one another. See, faith grasps a hold of the desired promise and believes that the promise will be fulfilled even before it happens, even before it's felt or even before it's received. The promise will be received or fulfilled in the time that you and I need it the most. This approach and or philosophy brings the feeling, here it comes, of peace. The feeling of happiness. The feeling that we all want to deal with so much, there it is. When we grasp a hold of the promise of who's telling us. Now, when I believe in what all I got, knowing who's telling me is the creator of all, knowing he's all powerful. Now, what do I got to do? I just got to wait. And I got to be happy. And I got to be joyous. And I got to celebrate. Guess what? I got to be having a great day every day, no matter what, because I know who's gave me the promise. So now I got a feeling of peace and of joy. Now I take faith and then I take feeling and I match them and I marry them together. Mark 9, 23, Yahushua said to him, if you are able to believe, all is possible to him who believes. And then again in Hebrews 11, 6, that's impossible to please him without faith. So faith is having deliberate confidence in Yahuwah without ever seeing him first. He will give you sign after sign that he is who he says he is. Now we're going to read Hebrews chapter 11. You got scriptures, go to Hebrew chapter 11. Y'all like how I brought that in? I do because I know that it can create a breakthrough for so many people. How many of y'all know that this is breakthrough information? How many of y'all feel that this is breakthrough information? How many of you, even if you're not a religious or a spiritual person going, I can use these principles in all areas of my life and I'm going to have a better life. Hebrews chapter 11, it says, now faith, I'm going to read New King James. That way everybody will understand some of these names. Now faith is the substance of, of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now you see why I went through that training. Now that, that sentence, that scripture makes since now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now I know how to take Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 that's quoted all the time. Now I know how to personally work it in my life. I know how to have peace and happiness while I'm waiting on the deliverance. You see that? Simple. 
For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Yahuwah, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That's all we got to hang on to. By faith, Abel offered to Yahuwah a more excellent sacrifice than did Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, Yahuwah testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, he still speaks. He's still speaking. By faith, Enoch, Kanok, was taken away so that he did not even see death and was not found because Yahuwah had taken him. For, he, he was take, for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased Yahuwah. How do you please him? With faith. That's what he wants. That's your ultimate gift to him. Faith that you believe he is. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to Yahuwah must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, aren't we glad that Noah had faith? Eight people, Noah and seven. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with incredible fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to what? Faith. By faith, Abraham, 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 you notice almost every prophet has a part of Yahuwah's name in their name. I'll just kind of throw that in so you can get it. What's Abraham means? And all of them is a witness, Acts 5.43. To him, all the prophets witness. So when you read Acts 5.43, you'll see how all the prophets witness. Because all, almost every one of them have a part of Yahuwah's name in their name. Abraham, which means the father Yahuwah of a multitude. That's what that means. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going, like a lot of us, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. How many of you ever felt like you're foreigners? Dwelling in tents with Isaac, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob, Yaakov. See their names? Isaac and Yaakov, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is Yahuwah. By faith, Sarah. Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. Woo! This is deep. Woo! She bore a child when she was past the age. She was past the age because she judged him faithful who had what? Promised. He had promised. So she believed in what we just went through earlier. That's why I had to take y'all through that first so you'll understand this chapter better. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, Abraham was way up in the age. I think he was like 99 years old. Were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith. Don't you want to die in faith? When I die, I want to die in faith, believing in his promises, not having received all the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I can relate. I mean, you can relate. When you get this, you're going to feel like, man, how come everybody ain't getting this? But that's okay. You're part of the remnant. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, Yahuwah is not ashamed to be called their Eloah. See, instead of me using that word God there, it's Eloah. Some people call it Elohim. That's plural, I'm going to use singular. Eloah, the mighty one. That's what that means, the mighty one. For he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, 
Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Look at that foretelling. Abraham gave up, he was going to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that Yahuwah was able to raise him up from even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Isaac, you know, Abraham said, look, if Yah Yahuwah wants me to sacrifice him, I'll go ahead and sacrifice him because surely he can raise him from the dead. And there was a lamb in the bush. You remember that? By faith, Yaakov, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of who? Not Joseph. We'll say it here. But Yasef. Yasef. Yahusef, actually. Yahusef. And worshiped the leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Yahusef, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel, Yashrael, Yashrael, and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, Moshe, that means the rescuer, is Yahuwah. That's what his name means, Moshe. Everybody loves the story of Moses. Guess what his name means? The rescuer is Yahuwah. How many of y'all need a rescue? How many of y'all need to be rescued? I need to be rescued. I'm calling on him. When he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, and because they saw he was a beautiful child, they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moshe, when he became of age, refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction when the people of Yahuwah, with the people of Yahuwah, then enjoying the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of the Messiah, greater riches than the treasures of Mitzrayim, Egypt. So where we get the word misery from. Egypt, his real name is Mitzrayim, misery, Mitzrayim, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Mitzrayim, Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover, Peshach, and the sprinkling of blood, of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, where is the Mitzrayites, Egyptians, attempting to do so were drowned. They didn't have the faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho, Jericho, fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab, Rahab, did not perish for those for with those who did not believe. When she received spies with peace, she was hiding the people of Yahuwah. She got a blessing for it. And what more shall I say? This is Paul, Shaul, that's his real name. Paul is writing this, the book of Hebrews, Shaul. Hebrews, real name is Ibrahim. Okay, what does he say? And what more shall I say? <laughs> He's getting into it. He's saying, this is the faith warriors. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and, Je and Jephthah, Je Jephthah, also Daoud and Shamal, Uel, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith, what they do, who through faith subdued and conquered kingdoms, Stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies, turned them back, the armies of the aliens, women received dead, raised back to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, scourgings, yes, and chains and an imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, sawn in two, cut them in half, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Of whom these people, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not totally receive the promise. Yahuwah having provided something better for us, 
that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That's dealing with the resurrection. That is the book. Hebrews chapter 11. How many of y'all got something out of that? How many of y'all that touched you? Listen about these faith warriors who are written about, who are legendary to this date that I can't wait to meet in the resurrection. I can't wait. But see, I think a lot of us want to look at this is prosperity. They want to look at, you know, receiving and believing you're going to get all this prosperity. When you understand the principles, when you understand the principles, you can also have the prosperity when you really understand it. Got, got you? But you're going to also have to deal with, with persecutions. You got to put it together. But a lot of times, many of us, we go through afflictions and then the world will go, aha, look, who are they? Oh, they must have done something wrong. Oh, they must be, oh, uh, look, they terrible. When somebody says something about you, or some organization says something about you, or some government says something about you, when people lie on you, there's a lot of people who go, aha, uh -huh. not understanding, not understanding the principles in these scriptures. What does Shaul, Paul say? Shaul writes in 2 Corinthians, get your scriptures turn them in, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 28. What does he say he went through? True believer. He said, from my own race, five times I was scourged with 40 stripes minus one. Time out. Shaul, Paul said, five times from his own people, the Yehuda, who we call Jews. He said, five times from my own race, I was scourged 40 stripes minus one. Now, scourge is key because it's not just whipped. That's where they put those metal pieces. You saw the passion of the Christ, how they whoop Yahusha. Well, when they hit the back, the metal gets down in the skin and rips out flesh. And the reason they did it 39 times, because they had it down to a science. If they did it 40 times, the person would die. They would lose too much blood on the 40th. On the 39th, they would be right at the edge of death. Shaul said five times, I was scourged, whipped with scourging five times. I was whipped with scourging. 39 rips it happened. He says three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And night and day, and a, a night and a day, I have been at on the ocean sea. I've been in journeys often, in the perils of the waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of non-believers, <clears throat> in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and in toil in sleep, sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness often, besides other things. But he still kept his faith because he knew what's coming. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30, Peter, whose real name is Kepha. Kepha means the rock is Yahuwah. Kepha stands for rock. Ah, Yahuwah. Kepha began to say to him, to Yahusha, he says, see, we have left all and followed you. I'm wrapping this thing up now, y'all. I'm wrapping it up. Y'all want to, shall we go up? Who's ready to go up? We're going to fit. You want to go up and finish strong? Shall we go up and finish strong? Are you ready? Because Kepha, sign named Peter, he comes to Yahusha, Hamashiach. He goes, see, we have left everything and followed you. What did Yahusha say to him? The, the Mashiach, the Savior, the Messiah. He answered him and said, assuredly, I want everybody to grab this as we close this out strong. We pull it all together now. Yahusha speaking to us. 
through this whole training on faith, now I want to bring home what he's got in my spirit to share with everybody that watches and views this and hears this. So Yahushua answered him when Kepha said, see, we've left everything and gave up everything to follow you. He said, surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake. Yahushua HaMashiach says, for his sake and the great news, the message of his message of salvation. If you left everything for that, that will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. Job, Job, he understood this. Job understood this. A hundredfold. He said, that's the, that's the promise. Most of us miss that promise because we get caught up in the feeling and we don't define the faith. When we put the faith together and we just stay happy no matter what, knowing we got to be tried and tested. We have all kind of proof that all the great followers of Yahuwah through his son, Yahuwah HaMashiach, all of us know that there's challenges. But he said, if you give it up for my sake, you'll receive a hundredfold. But let me finish the sentence. This is where most people get lost. So I'm going to rewind it back. I said, assuredly, the Savior said these words. Do you believe his promise? See, assuredly means I want to be emphatic about this. I want to make sure you understand this. I assuredly I say to you that no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the great news of salvation shall not receive a hundredfold in this time. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and lands. Here we're going to finish it. With persecutions. With persecutions. I've been blessed coming, going forward, back. If you want to know the story of my life and the stance of my life, I've received a hundredfold in this life and persecutions. Still go through them. Going through them right now. Hardcore persecutions I'm going through right now. But I stand on his promise. I got, jo I got unspeakable joy Right now, falsely accused, lied on, cheated on, stolen from, pure joy is what I got. I got to scream it out because I know who's promised me. And then he said, not only in this life, he finishes it and says, in the age to come, eternal life. Mark 11, 23 through 24. So Yahusha answered and said to them, have faith in Yahuwah, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he or she will have whatever he or she says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I've taught you now how to exercise and have faith. I pray this has been a great message to help elevate your life. I promise you, with all the promises of Yahuwah, the creator of all, through his son, Yahuwah HaMashiach, the Messiah who gave up his life for all so that we may approach him not deserving it, but through his promise and belief that he did come back to restore us unto the Father. I promise you that these promises that we read about are true. These words that I spoke to you today are true. Yahuwah, the heavens, the earth, the ocean, the sea is my witness that these things be truth and be true unto you.
I thank you for this time. May you be blessed abundantly. If you'd like for me to share more of these types of teachings, be sure to reach out to me. I don't know where to go from here with this message. It's my first time I've ever done this out live on social media platforms. If you'd like for me to share more of these type messages, I'd appreciate some communication from you. I'm going to pray on this. I'm going to walk in this. I'm going to absorb this. And I hope you understood that everything I came to you today was from the bottom of my heart. And my tears are tears of happiness because I believe I've been faithful. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Only promote the truth. <laughs>